Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 205. So glad you could join me. Uh, Dante DiStefano, longtime contributor to uh, Poet Respond in particular, is here as the main guest. He'll be with us in just a few minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. Uh, we just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notifications. Leave reviews on any other podcast catchers where you might be listening to this. Anything you do to help spread poetry around the internet would be much appreciated. That's all we ask around here, so just uh, click something. Click like or who knows what, whatever it does. That's how these machine algorithms work. So um, click something if you would. Now, as always, we're going to start with our... Um, Poet Respond Poet, and we have a haiku. I think this is the third haiku in the Poet Respond series, and the last one won a Touchstone Award. is one of the haiku of the year from the Haiku Society of North America. So um, following in some great footsteps there is Elizabeth, Elizabeth McMoon to Tango, and uh, here she is right now. Um, hi, Elizabeth. Uh, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm great. It's great to have you on. You've been a... Uh, you know, a poet we publish frequently. I think you've been in uh, Poets Respond a few times now. You've been an Ekphraxic Challenge winner a few times. Um, and always with, with short forms, and, and not forms, but like short poems, You like, like a tight, concise poem. Um, and this is the first, I think, haiku of yours we've published. Um, do you want to tell us about how it came to be and, and you know why you wrote it in the way you did? Yeah, so I live close to, well, I live in the Central Valley, and it's about two hours away from the coast, so we had left, and we were driving back, um, and it was really hot, which is why we went there, and I looked over as I was driving back, and it was night, and I could see this on the side of the road, and I was just like, I need to write about this. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. So it's a it's a traditional haiku inspired by nature. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um and, and why um why the haiku form here and how often do you write haiku too? Is that something that you usually do? I know you like short poems, so um is that something that you're always into? Yeah, I I try to write them a lot. During the pandemic I had just like one um one document and I wrote a ton of them and I haven't been doing it as much recently. I really like trying to condense things, um, which is why I think most of my poems are really short. Um <laughs> But so it's a form that I really like, um, just generally. Yeah. Well, let's. Uh, why don't you go ahead and read this uh, this this haiku, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit more. Definitely. So, heat dome, a man's black speedo on the sidewalk. Yeah, just a great poem. Heat dome, a man's black speedo on the sidewalk, and you, you mentioned um, you know, liking to condense poems. Um, and is that your, is your process more to write out lo at length and then condense later? Or do you tend to, uh, you know, does it come out at this size? I feel like things tend to start condensed. Sometimes I try to write things that are a little bit longer and I feel like it doesn't come naturally to me. I'm always reading other people's poems that are longer and more kind of narrative and just admiring them. But that's just not how my brain works. It doesn't, I don't know, it only works in these small bits. <laughs> yeah, well, very fun. And they're always so musical too. Um, you know, and, and so I recommend everybody go back and look at Elizabeth's poems that have been on Rattle throughout the years. There have been, I think, only maybe about a dozen or so that we've published. So um, definitely a lot of great stuff to look back at. Um, Elizabeth, it's a short poem, so it's a short segment, but thanks so much for joining us. It's really wonderful to be able to share a haiku. I mean, I, I was mentioning before we went online that, you know, it hit a lot of notes because it hit, a, it, I, I wanted form, and so haiku's a form. That's always great. And then it's funny, <laughs> which uh, is always something that we don't have enough of. And then um, it's also a climate change poem that hits it at a different angle and does something different. We get so many climate change poems that it's just great to have. It's hard to find things that say something new. And so to have a humorous sort of image here with the, with the climate change going on in the background is something that's really wonderful as well. So thanks so much for sharing. That was a great poem. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye. Yeah, that was Elizabeth McMoon to Tango uh, with a haiku from a set, uh, Sunday's poem on Poets Respond and Rattle.com. If you would like to receive a poem every day in your inbox... Um, all you got to do is sign up at rattle.com and you receive poems like this every Sunday, but also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Those are the days of the week and those are when you'd receive poems. So um, if you don't receive the daily poem by email, sign up to do that. 
Now we're going to take a quick break and go to our main guest, Dante Di Stefano. So sit tight, and I'll be right back with more poetry. And we're back. Thanks for your patience. And like I said, tonight's guest is Dante Di Stefano. Dante is the author of four poetry volumes, including most recently the book-length poem Midwhistle, which is what we'll be focusing on today. Um, his other poetry collections are Love is a Stone, Endlessly in Flight, um, Ill Angels, and Lullaby with Incendiary Device, published in a three and one edition entitled Generations. Um, Etruscan Press in 2022, also featuring work by William Hyen, who we'll talk about, and H.L. Hicks. His poetry, essays, and reviews have appeared in Best American Poetry, Prairie Schooner, Swanee Review, all sorts of amazing publications. He's won a ton of awards, too, um, including the Auburn Witness Poetry Prize, the On Teaching Poem Prize, the Manchester Poetry Prize, the Red Hen Press Poetry Award, the Thayer Fellowship, the Ruth Stone Poetry Prize, and the Ellen Ginsberg Poetry Award, as well as prizes from the Academy of American Poets, the Mississippi Review, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So many. I mean, he's a really established, really well published poet. He holds a PhD in English literature from Binghamton University and teaches high school English in Endicott, New York, and lives in Endwell, New York, with his wife Christina, their daughter Luciana, and their son Dante Jr., and their golden doodle Sonny. And so, Dante Di Stefano, uh, it's so great to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Tim. So happy to be here. Yeah, I mean, I've been a fan of your work. You, you've, I've looked back at the sort of the role of, of when we've published you, just by typing in. If you go to, um, you know, rattle.com, you can type in the search bar, Dante Di Stefano, and, and then the poem has come up, and it's been almost like a poem a year for like 10 years. And so we've been publishing for a long time, a few in print, um, a lot of poets respond. So it's really great to meet you. And, and I feel like I know you already, even though, you know, we haven't actually met in person, which is the funny thing about poetry. Um, so I'm so glad to have you. I'm glad to be here, and I admire your work as an editor and a poet so much, too, so I'm happy to meet you face-to-face -face here. Yeah, well, your book, um, we mentioned in the bio that your book um, is a, written in part to the poet William, uh, William Hayen, and uh, at Midwhistle, and yeah. that line comes from one of his poems. Um, can you, I think you want to start out by reading one of his poems, the, the poem that this, the book title was I'd love to. From. But, um, but also... Um, tell us a little bit about why you um, were drawn to William's work and, and how this book came to be. Well, I um, I had been familiar with William Hayen's works for a long time because um, he pub he was the editor of the first um, the first nine eleven anthology that came out after nine eleven, and that's the first time I I was familiar with his work. Also, Etruscan Press was founded by Binghamton University graduates, so I was always interested in that press um, because that's my alma mater. And, um, you know, so over the years, I had read many of his collections, um, and then I became an Etruscan Press 
poet. Um, and then we had a book together and I, you know, it was the book that you mentioned that includes my, a collection by me. I'm in my forties, a collection by a 60 year old poet, HL Hicks, who's an amazing poet and a collection by William and who's in his eighties. And, um, you know, through that process, I really got, you know, I got to know him very well. I became a, 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 um, a uh, pen pal of his, um, you know, one of the first things he did was send me this huge box full of books that he had written, some of which I already had, but all of which were signed. And he writes poems on the back of baseball cards and he does all of these like art projects. And he sent me all these things in the mail. Um, and from there on, I've, you know, developed this, this correspondence with him. And also he has a, um, he's been keeping a, a, a journal since 1964 um, of his everyday life, um, which also includes a lot of things about poetry. So one day he'll be talking about having, um, you know, Ann Sexton read at the college where he taught. And the next next day he'll be talking about how um, he thinks the garbage men stole his golf club. So like, it's like, <laughs> you know, this and about his kids and about all the things he did in the sixties and seventies. And I mean, it goes on. This is, this is like, I don't know. There's like seven or eight volumes of this. I'm only up to the eighties right now. So it's just an amazing document of a poet's life. Um, a suburban poet who was also ambitious, but also just a regular person. Um, so like, I have a certain understanding of him as a man uh, that differs from the understanding I have of other poets who I who I just read their poems and you know them in that particular way. Mm -hmm. um, so he's somebody I really admire and somebody who is st still alive. He's 82. He's still writing poems. He's still publishing in all these small presses. And, um, you know, I just if anybody's, you know, anybody who's listening to this, check out William Haynes poetry if if you if you haven't um he was really well known in the 70s and 80s and 90s but i think he's one of those who's you know there's so many people writing poetry that it's hard to you know but he's somebody who's accomplished so much and and his poetry is so variegated and beautiful uh and he's still writing just tremendous poems i'll, I'll read blackbird spring now which is the poem that in you know incited mid whistle blackbird spring mid morning walking ocean shoreline i found a hundred blackbirds frozen in ice only their heads protruding black eyes open gleaming most of their sharp beaks still scissoring in mid whistle feeding they'd been caught in sea spray must be all males up north early Scarlet epaulets aflame a few inches under. I chipped one bird loose with a stone, held it in gloved hands under the rising sun until, until I realized, until I realized nothing I hadn't known. The tide retreated and would return. Within the austere territories, these would have filled with belligerence and song. Spring had begun. Yeah, that's a beautiful poem um, by William Hyen. And I especially love that turn, um, until I realized nothing I hadn't known. Like right when you expect the, um, you know, the big reveal of the deep, profound philosophical thing, it's like, you know, yes, this is something that we all, you know, that I've already thought about, that we all think about already. And but we're still we're here in this moment, which is just a, a fascinating turn in that poem. I love that. And I love too. That poem, um, you know, because he spent so much time in uh, the Brockport, New York area, which is near my hometown of Rochester. And so I know, I mean, for me, that poem, I know exactly that Lake Ontario, that sea spray turning to ice. I have like vivid memories of like walking down the piers and just those like, you know, 10, you know, like several feet deep layers of this beautiful ice that just appears on the on the lake, uh, you know, on the piers and things like that. It's just amazing. And you can really imagine how birds could be trapped in that and the image which feels almost surreal in the poem is very real at the same time and so a really great poem and, and it's great to be introduced to a poet that i'm not all too familiar with i think i'm a you know I've, I've heard of him and i've read a few of his poems but not that many and so it's really great i think poets need champions which is one of the things i love seeing you do you know i mean there are so many poets in the world 
and you know to keep their voices alive which is what we're trying to do as poets we need you know people to to speak about the poets they love it's sort of a you know passing down the torch and carrying on you know what matters and so doing that that act of continuing and, and focusing on William Hayen's work um, is just such an important thing to do how much of that is um, something that you set out to do in in what you're doing here with this book is it, do you want to introduce more people to William's work yeah I think you know I think that for me, I'll, you know, every, the reason that one of the, re, if I had to say a reason why I write poetry, which I don't think there's a reason other than I like doing it, but um, I think one of the reasons I write poetry is this impulse to be in dialogue, you know, and like the poem, the the book Midwhistle is just, you know, one, one of the kind of impetus, one of the impetuses for it would be like just wanting to talk to William Hayen in a way that is other than like the letters that I write to him, you know, like in, in, in a lyric fashion or something, you know, this, this urge to uplift, you know, this life that's fountaining through my life. You know, we have all these poets and poems that are fountaining through our lives and, and that we love. And, and, and one of the things that I find myself doing time and again in my work is just, you know, uplifting those enthusiasm up uplifting those things that I love many of the times those are poets and poems and you know I wanted to talk to William Hayen in a poem but also talk to my son because it was written when my son was in utero my second our second child and to talk to my wife as well so I'm talking to this you know to me a towering figure in the world of poetry but I'm also talking to the man my son will be in the future and my wife and my daughter and my dog, you know, like, I, and, and, you know, to have whoever else wants to listen. So, yeah. 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 Well, to me, I've always thought of as poetry is sort of the grand dialogue of the human race, you know, going back to the oral tradition when that was the storytelling we were doing and then having a place in that dialogue is what we're doing by making poems. And so, you know, not just like you said, having, you know, writing letters, which is great to poets that you admire, but having it, you know, in the grand dialogue, you know, is something that's that's so valuable, too. Um, do you want to read the, the first section um, you're going to so we can get a sense of the voice and what's going on in this book? Sure. Out of the Azure. I'm listening to the earth to Bill Hayen read blackbirds back into the sky above the earth to space junk hurtling over the sky, hurtling under it, while hand hurtles through time, back to Robert Penn Warren, back through Auschwitz, through ashes to Salon, through Hiroshima to Whitman, back through Rumi to Keats, below the surface of Walden Pond, back to woods stilled in a Long Island night 70 years ago. I am listening to a man read himself through remembrance against nostalgia, against this little boy, Enola Gay, and Oppenheimer's sleep. I'm listening and trying to hear myself in old age, 40 years from now, become another this uplifted, spun out of the azure, into the syntax of an erased elegy. I talk there and handle a hope for a one who no longer exists. I'm dreaming upstate reading my own blackbirds back into my own backbone, back to those days spent bicycling around the neighborhood from corner store to the oak tree by the cemetery gate, where my brother and I wolfed down sub sandwiches and let June unfold so indolently around us. Blackbirds flew overhead then in a V, thousands of them, as they will tonight when I put my daughter to sleep while their calling booms through my skull at bedtime, my daughter asked me to tell her one more story before I can even say once upon a once. And this is the whole interior jewel and thiefdom of a poem. A once before once you say in the dark because of love. Yeah, beautiful opening poem that was um, to Midwhistle, um, Dante Stefano's newest book. Uh, from University of Wisconsin Press. And that's one of the things, uh, you, yeah. you mentioned that this poem was written for your, your son, who was in utero at the time of writing it. And that was that's really the thing that, that yes. sort of is so moving about your poems that we've published, I think. is the one thing, if I had to think of one thing that stands out, it's the intimacy of the voice. You can feel it 
being directed to mostly your children, sometimes your, your wife, uh, Christina, too. Um, but, um, but there's this, this real feeling that, that you're talking to someone in particular and not just like writing poems for us and for literary, you know, fame and publishing and magazines and books and stuff. But these are, are sort of letters chiseled in stone or something to the future, um, people you care about. And, and that's always been really, tr really apparent just in the voice itself with the poems. Um, can you, can you speak to that? Like, why do you feel like that's something that's worth pursuing? I just, you know, I think before I had children, I was always writing my poems to my wife. And before I knew my wife, I don't think I was even really writing poems. I think I needed, I mean, I, I think like, you know, Stanley Kunitz said that he felt like all of his poems are love poems. And, and I feel like that too, in a way. Um, and I, I think, you know, once I had children, poems became something different for me. You know, it just became it just became uh, something an artifact. You know, to pass on. Uh, you know, uh, it's just an impulse that I have, and and it just feels right to me that that I should be writing to these, you know, little creatures afoot in my home. You know, that I should be writing to them, and because all we do as parents is think about their future and think about them. You know as they are now and as they will be someday. And, you know, that fills up my heart and my mind. So of course it's going to be, um, you know, what becomes the vertebrae of all my poems, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, especially because um, on the, the workshopping we do on the critique of the week, one of the things I often say, you know, to people, you can sort of feel a sort of detached sense in a lot of poems and I think it's so so valuable to be thinking of yourself as writing poems to a specific person, even if it's it's sort of like when you go to a reading, um, or you're or you're giving a, a lecture or something. You know, you're not just like speaking to a crowd. You're like picking people out in the crowd and talking specifically to them, and that makes it connect with everybody else. And so there's just a way that there's an intimacy to speaking to somebody, um, that you know, is brought out in poetry when you're doing that. And so, you know, it's just a great technique to think of a poem as a letter to somebody, um, you know, even if a stranger that you don't know or somebody, you know, your, your closest reader or whatever it is. But when you're writing to somebody, the writing is so much more powerful. Yeah, and I think that there's also so many things that we can't say or that we mean to say in our everyday life um, that we can say in different ways ways um in poems so you know that's another aspect of it too i think yeah definitely well let, let's hear another poem from the book uh what's next okay this is the second section um and unyet just begun i wonder bill how to make a poem flare in the dark out of love and stay lit though the voice cracks and wanes in age that reverse ad lesson that adjuncts the casket's last dose of sunlight and weather. But I must remind myself that it is enough to make and dwell in the music of a poem for the moment of its unfolding without reaching after some wretched shipwreck urn of an endless gathering vast hereafter. To put it another way, there is no once but this once, no ever but now, no then, or than, or greater than such, and thus, and heretofore hence, building from lung to larynx. I'm singing for my wife and for my little daughter and for the fetus growing in my wife's belly, for now, and unyet just begun. For my deciduous boyhood and the boyhoods of my friends and brothers, the girlhoods of my wife and mother, for the infinite riots in a soul linden tree's blossom, for the canticle I held in one closed fist as a kid, alongside an empty fist, asking the wind to guess which hand it was in. For a boat a boy was made from a halved walnut, bubble gum, and toothpick fitted with a tiny kite of sleep for a topsail. I am still sailing that ship, all my sisters below decks, the corpse of my father lashed to the mast by the sirens, which are neither meant as myth nor as metaphors carol out over the wind dark seas the strange facts of what it is that buzzes in the eardrum of every pregnant moment 
I wonder if this poem and the each eye who speaks it through and through it has gone too irrevocably astray. But the preoccupation of this poem, its initial impetus and its lone aim was to talk across time, Bill, to the you at 24 beginning a journal aimed at your grandchildren and I and the multitudes any one reader incarnates as audience. I see you through the haze of cigarette smoke and poker games already in your mid-twenties, holding the long woolen lapel of a kind of ambition that seems itself as an alphabet of sorrow and enduring. I see you perched urbanely between Anne Sexton and Al Poland at the Brockport Writers Forum, the three of you discussing confession a handful of years after M.L. Rosenthal critic confessionalism to life. The thin black necktie of your apprenticeship had not been taken off yet, and yet you hold forth with a quiet poise which would have been beyond me at that age, maybe at this one. There is so much life to live and die into in an hour. Kafka's phrase comes to mind in the struggle between yourself and the world. Hold the world's coat. Perhaps that's the real aim of this poem, to hold the world's coat. No, that's not right. The phrase is incidental. The real aim is to talk to you, myself, is to talk my, to myself, to you, without being too inward turned and returning without. Again, I think of you, Han, sitting in your easy chair in the single line couplets of a cadence all your own, ensconced in the mastery of 80 years, heart being the blue hour hidden in the yoke of a syllable, counting syllables inside the hour of that syllable, unpeeling an undersong just below the audible, just beyond the eye and ink and the symmetry and lack of line bivouacked upon line. I am there whittling your face into my grandfather's cane 30 years ago as he told a story from his war, something about the tattoos on prisoners' arms after they were liberated from the camps. I can't quite recall his words. The story, Cinder Now, a mouthful smoldering in the obscurity of a century that's not done with us just yet. Kafka died almost a decade before the Nazis came to power. His fragments were like that poem by Adam Zagajewski, trying to praise the suture and the wound, the thrush lost in the mulberry bush, the world mutilated as it is, the unfinished and broken as ethic and aesthetic, the only healthy response to a diseased and dying planet in its pinprick of a galaxy tucked inside God's own sewn shut breast pocket. I am breaking always, as you are too, into other selves and asymmetries and such. This universe as such is only one among many. This multiverse is all one, and I and you and we, they retrace our snowshoot steps back to the infinite now of a phoneme stuck in the throat. Bill, your blackbirds frozen in ocean waves keep returning to me, their immobile beaks petrified into endless, soundless screeching I can't mute or unmute for that matter. My wife and I will be joined by a newborn soon, due on August 9th, the day we wed, anniversary also of Nagasaki's bombing, a reminder of how all dates, calendars, and nations mine and scar and tentacle of the memorial impulse mocks even as it unearths how a vow contains its own arsenic i do in it and yet how shabby our lives would be if we didn't dare avow ourselves to husband and wife ourselves with the faith in the wound happiness makes yeah i, I love that last line in particular uh that with a faith in the wound happiness makes uh, beautifully put and so many uh, great descriptions of what poetry does too. Um, this you know to hold the world's coat as the aim of poetry but then really it, just to talk to each other I, I love that that section of two and again we're reading a uh, poems from midwistle this is a book length poem um written to william hayen and uh dante di stefano's son um that's Midwistle once again. And Dante, there's a little bit of a lag on the uh, video. I think I want to, um, can we take a quick break 
and and see if we can like maybe hang up and connect and if anybody else is watching like streaming in your house maybe tell them to stop until this is over um you know if anybody's watching live or something because um i think it, it's fine but but it's sort of messing with the speed of the poems being read and so i want to get that better if we can so i'm going to uh go to just a quick break and, and just hang up and, and reconnect maybe we'll get a better connection this time okay okay thanks yeah, so it's Dante Stefano. He's just going to hang up really quick and uh, come back in a second. We'll see if we can get uh, the new connection is a little bit more sturdy. But those are beautiful poems. Uh, really, I mean, so many wonderful. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, people in the chat windows are listing, you know, the hidden in the yoke of a syllable, God's own sewn shut breast pocket. Yeah, I mean, that's just wonderful. So we'll see if uh, we can get a better connection if we if we hang up and reconnect. It happens occasionally. Um, Dante, are you back? Hey, Dante, are you there? Hi, Tim. Hey, let's see. I think hopefully yeah. that's... It, it was weird because a lot of times it's um, breaking up because of a bandwidth, but this time it was like a lag. So so normally I'd tell you to shut your video off and maybe they'd be better, but I think this might help. So we'll see if we get a better connection now. Yeah, it's looking better. Even even right now it's okay. looking better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so what I want to talk about now, so a few people have asked um, already, and I was just saying how beautiful these poems are. They're really wonderful. Um, just so many great phrases. And, you know, one of the things that I always thought about as I was doing, um, you know, social media for poems is how few, like, quotable lines there are in contemporary poetry. Um, you know, it's sort of hard to excerpt things without the context of the, the voice and the narrative that are going on within the poem. And one of the things that's great about these poems is there are so many quotable things. I mean, you know, it's, it's like a, a social media editor's dream, <laughs> maybe, too, to just be able to quote um, so many lines. Can you talk about your, your writing process and coming up with, with phrases like that, like the hidden in the yoke of a syllable, which in a way sounds influenced maybe by William Hay and the, the poems I know of his are, are that the sort of ornate and intricate. Um, and, and, you know, so everything is sort of beautifully condensed. In William Hayne's poems, like we saw in the the first poem there, uh, how do, what's your writing process like to to come up with a book like this that has great lines like that 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 are so quotable? Uh, well, I I feel like this was different than my general writing process because it was kind of all one thing that I was doing, um, and because I had never written, I had tried to write long poems before many times because I've always loved book length poems and I've always been interested in them but I could never figure a way in and then I was just so overwhelmed by some of William Ann's poems and uh and also by m my wife's pregnancy and the, I the first step was I wrote a 10 page you know single stanza and uh you know just a column like stick it uh you know one thing uh you know, which incorporated some of what I just read and some parts that, you know, come later on. And I wrote this thing in one sitting at night and, you know, uh, I did, I just, I thought it was pretty good. And I sent it to William Hayen and he, in the mail, and he wrote me a letter back and said, you know, keep working on this, but uh, break it into stanzas because you're <laughs> you're gonna kill your reader with, you know, <laughs> like, no, give the reader relief, you know. So I have been reading his book, um, to William Mer Merwin, which is a book length poem, and uh, you know that that um, that that is in a well, it's in quatrains, and you know this one's in syncanes, but um, it's you know the, it is like. I use that kind of as as a as a as a formal spur, and then you know I just kept working on it. It took me about two months to write it, and then it was kind of like a kitchen sink approach. I was throwing everything into it that I, I had, um, and you know I just and I I decided that I you know put some interludes where I'd go away from talking directly to Hayen or my son, you know, kind of like interludes like in a musical album you know, like an R&B album from the 90s or something where they have an interlude and it's like, you know, or a skit or something. Um, so that was a way to break up the... And, you know, I don't know. I, I just wrote it and then I revised it a lot. Um, but I feel like it's very imperfect. You know, like there's it's very rough. There's a lot of places where 
it becomes very prose prosy um and less lyrical and there are a lot of shifts in it um but ultimately i feel like that's part of for me what certain long poems are and do like when i think about a arm in book length poem or you know like even like the book of nightmares by galway canal or you know ruth stones who is the widow's muse muse there's certain like imperfections in the you know it's it's there's a it's raw it's a little bit raw mm -hmm. um but in terms of like the original question i don't know i just write it you know <laughs> the, in terms of like <laughs> i don't know it's not a very <laughs> fancy answer but y you know how it is you just write it and you there's not really a i mean i revise things some things i don't revise like when i'm writing for the the poems that you've taken for the um poets respond a lot of those are written during my lunch period at work at the high school where i work and then some of them i might revise at the end of the day but a lot of the times i just send them you know and I, you have a feeling this is not going to waste Tim Green's time to, to read it. I'm just going to send you something that I don't think, is, you know, is, you know, is worth your time. But, you know, so, so there's, you know, I don't know. I think I'm going far afield of what you asked, but digressions are the same late. No, definitely, definitely. It, it is interesting, too. One of the things I wanted to talk about was how to make a book-length poem work. And one of the things I was going to say was, um, you know, you need to sort of be shifting gears a lot or else, you know, you can't keep up with a with a rich poetry, you know, for, for that long, you know, a lyric poem that's really dense, you know, and 100 pages long is just sort of exhausting. And so you need to find a way mm -hmm. to, to shift and sort of slow down and speed up and and do, you know, like, you know, like if you had a, you know, a symphony or something, you can't have the, uh, nothing but loud notes or you'll just be exhausted mm -hmm. by the time, you know, the second movement or whatever. I'm not a classical music person. I don't even know what a movement is. But anyway, you know, you get the point that, uh, you know, and, and so so how do you. You know what did you look at? You you mentioned a few uh, books of long poems, and and you being more and more interested in long poems. So so how what were you sort of going for in the the use of the long poem, and and, and what do you think that is the best sort of use of that form? I guess because I'm because we don't see a lot of those. You know, I mean like Anne Carson's autobiography of Red is one of my favorite books. You can name mm -hmm. a few, um, but they're they're just mm -hmm. not that many, and um, mm -hmm. and it's it's such an interesting sort of way to go about poetry that we really don't anymore. Even though that was like the beginnings of poetry, you know. I mean, you know, they yeah. all started as epics, and so we really don't do that anymore. So so what were you? What was your aim in putting? Why are you drawn to to book length now? I mean, I think it's one of those things where you think there's not a lot of them, but when you start looking for them, you see them everywhere. <laughs> It's, uh, there's more than you think, um, it, you know, and, you know, like there's also books that are like you had uh, Julia Kolchinsky Dasbach on a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. and like 40 weeks book. That's kind of like that's like a project book. It's not quite a book length poem, but it's all one motion, you know. So there's a lot of books that could be, you know, like are in some ways in that same kind of uh, territory as a book length poem. But like, I just, I've always been interested in certain, like the early, like early ones that I read um, from the 20th century were like, you know, the William Carlos Williams was like Patterson. Like that's, that's, you know, I, that's what we call like a hybrid text now or something like that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but it's, you know, that's, that's an interesting, and you know, like Pounds Cantos and all that. Um, you know, there's all these early modernist uh, book length. Melvin Tolson, the black writer, not a lot of people um, read his um, book length poem, Harlem Gallery. Um, that's a great book length poem from the early 20th century. Um, and then like the mid 20th century, um, just like, I mean, I was, I've just always been really knocked out by the Book of Nightmares by Galway Canal. He wrote it in like the early late 60s early 70s he wrote it to his children and he wrote it like at the height of the vietnam war and the tumult of all that you know that was going on in the 60s and and it's just an incredible so that was one of my early um models and then i just was always looking for long poems you know ar Ammons has a million of them you know like four or five books at least that are taped for the turn of the year garbage 
Blair, Sphere, um, Ann Carson, of course. And she has those books, not only like the autobiography of Red, but also like Knox and which is a, you know, kind of a box that, you know, like that's a strange, like a box that is also a book length poem, but it's also like an artifact in a, in a strange way. Tahimba Jess's Olio, that's kind of like all yeah, one thing, yeah. like a book length, pro- you know, so there's, there's, a, I mean, I could keep going. <laughs> Nathaniel Mackey, he's got a million, um, you know, there's, there's just, there's more, even like I was surprised like a couple years ago, I know Ruth Stone's work very well, but I didn't realize she had the book length poem, Who uh, Who is the Widow's Muse? Uh, one of my friends told me about it. And then I, I, you know, you can't, it's out of print, you know, I got a copy, but it was pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great, it's a great kind of forgotten book length poem. So there's a ton out there. Um, but I think you're right about, you know, the structure has to be, variegated you have to you have to figure out a way in for me it was writing to somebody which was bill Han and also my son it was also the formal constraints of you know this is where also rattle comes in because you interviewed a.e stallings i don't know a couple of years ago and she was talking about the seven syllable line and um how adaptable that is so that's like the basic unit of this poem is the seven syllable line you know sometimes break out of that but um but it was kind of like that was one of the formal constraints of the the book so the, yeah. giving yourself some pattern i'm sorry mm-hmm. right i'm just talking <laughs> no, i was just thinking though you know but even two years ago we talked about syllabics with a.e stallings and um, i said i can't hear like i don't even notice syllabics and i did not notice that this yeah. was uh you know seven syllables lines so <laughs> yeah. so it continues but it is it's great to have a constraint for sure yeah, yeah i think that kind of pattern or yeah go ahead yeah well i think we should read another uh, section so let's do uh the next one you sure. have up okay all right this is the fourth section this mattering of music our unyet bill is a boy in the ultrasound pictures, he looks like an aerial view of a giant island in the little lake just now. And if current events tell us anything, it's that points of view matter urgently and that we are not islands. The sea slowly swallows up, but either a Pangea or an archipelago of competing needs and no's and grievances and yeses. And this was the case before the pandemic and always. It's true, our nation always spoke the language of zip tie and riot, of jackal, pledge, and endless blocked amendment. And it is easier to uncot into such unjust truths that make America's great idiom a shared awkward admission of guilt and grief, lighting the tongue from sea to shining and other traumas. But I look at him, my unborn. I hear in the unrung bell between the lines of this poem, a voice, a shapeless flame, One note repeated on all poems, love, this flowering promise, this mattering of music, the unnamed fact of him, fire. Bill, I think of your meetings with James Dickey, his falling stewardesses and blind kids, beating their closed eyes beneath my own sleep-shuttered eyelids. Can a poem one day blitz and undo the language of warfare shotgunned into halftime and pastime and pregame the way a tailgate might? unhinge itself on the starlight of a syllable you hut, hut, hike from the diaphragm and drift back in the pocket and dispocket in the drift, scanning the roots all poems take from air to hand to end zone. We poetry lovers are all wide receivers, out in the open, hands outstretched, rewriting the audible in our, in our bellies, undoing the rote logic of playbooks, Improvising the motion, whistling through our own muscles. Sing for us the dragonfly and the arc of an anthem. The bumblebee zigzagging the sidelines of an empire. I praise your lord dragonfly, Bill, and praise the ambition it must take to unamorst a clover and a bee from the funerals in a brain, from the prairie and its yacht. Are we all just corporations of want and want and desire and compete and cut and die and rot? and rise tomorrow anew, defiant, refreshed. Again, Bill, I'm thinking of you and the 
perfect spiral Dickie hurled in your poem to Merwin. Itself spiraled out, unraveling right here. How he could suspend a sled burial and melody with a dream ceremony and how you leapt from his voice to your father's dying bed and your brother Werner's ghost, which reminds me of a phrase tossed off by a friend in a friend's poem. We talk to other the ghosts. We poets, when our wives are asleep, when our husbands snore, when our restless children toss their dreams in a tight spiral, spiraling back into lines raveled in our fingertips. We poets talk to ourselves, talking to the past, to those heroes and mentors who light our way. We walk off from, we talk to other the ghosts. Yeah, another great line. We talk to other the ghosts. It's uh, again, reading sections from uh, Midwhistle, the book length poem by Dante Di Stefano. And, uh, and really interesting, the way that this book works almost as an explanation for what we're doing with poetry, which is something weird, you know, that that we have to explain <laughs> to people. But we do. I mean, that's the fact of the matter. <laughs> you know, I you know, there's um, I was looking at somebody talking about TikTok poetry um, earlier and how poetry is like blossoming on TikTok, apparently. And then, you know, we all sort of go through the experience of like, do we do we explain why that's not actually poetry? <laughs> you know, to, to people who want to talk about that topic or, or do we do just feel like jerks for doing that? But, but there is something that that's really, you know, that's different that, that we're doing as poets in this little niche that poetry is. Um, and, and I think the book does a great job of explaining that actually, um, explaining that, that dialogue that we're all taking part of that, that, that sort of deeper, you know, time stamped and, and chiseled dialogue um so what was it I, it makes me curious i'm always you know i do ask this question all the time but but how did you get into poetry I and mean, you mentioned um in your email to me before that your your dad was a postal worker your mom a homemaker and, and then a secretary at sydney binghamton um and and that you know there's no sort of you know sense of uh, how you became a poet in that in those like superficial details so what was it that drew you to poetry in the first place when you were young well, I was named after a poet, obviously, and um, <laughs> there you go. that I, that's part of my family history. You know, my great grandfather, when he came from Sicily, one of the only thing he brought with him was a, a copy of the Commedia. And, you know, that was a thing in Italian households, like having a Bible and a copy of the Divine Comedy that was like, you know, kind of part of like the social f fabric of life back then. My aunt still has that book. Um, but anyway, so that was always in the background, this, the name of a poet that I was named after a poet. And, you know, there was poetry in my house growing up. My grandmother loved Robert Frost and Carl Sandburg, like a lot of people from her generation, from the World War II generation. You know, they had that public schooling, um, you know, where, you know, poetry was an important part of, of their, you know, the curriculum that they were raised in and, um, I don't know. I, so it was always there in some way. And then when I got, I love to read always, you know, mm -hmm. I've always loved reading so much. From the time I was a little kid, re my parents were really religious. So I had to read the Bible a lot and go to Catholic mass all the time. <laughs> but, you know, you get a lot of poetry that way and a lot of kind of cultural context that is going to help you to be a reader of poetry. Um, and then when I got older, I like, you know, like loved comic books, loved Raul Dahl loved all the, you know, the Hardy Boys, then got into things like Melville, Dostoevsky, all that in high school. And when I got into college, I somehow discovered Howl by Allen Ginsberg and also um, Archaic Torso of Apollo by Rilke. And I got a Dover Thrift edition of Gerard Manley Hopkins. And, you know, like those three poets just were so amazing to me. I was reading them on my own and I didn't really know anything about what poetry was and thinking about how different the wreck of the Deutschland is from, from, you know, Howell from this sonnet by Rilke translated by Stephen Mitchell, you know, like how different these things are and yet they're called poems. And then thinking about how emotionally connected I was to these things and how I wanted to say them out loud. And, you know, then after that, I took a, I took a couple of um, creative writing classes and I was encouraged by the teachers I had 
Um, and then I just kept reading, 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 writing, and you know, I've been doing it ever since. So that's that's kind of how I got into it. I found I found that it was the type of reading that I loved most. You know, like I I just wanted to understand. You know, and then I, I realized I had read a lot of poems before, but I hadn't thought about it. You know, like I had read the, I had read the Inferno. I had read Purgatorio when I was younger. I had read um, Paradiso. I had read the Iliad, the Odyssey, but I hadn't thought of them as poems, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, th to think all these things could be poems and and then to think I could I could talk to those poems across time, you know, even you know, even when I was first starting and just filling up, you know, these marble composition notebooks with what I'm sure was just crazy, <laughs> you know, like just, just like, you know, just like I don't think much of what I first wrote even made any sense, but it, it was like a delight in in wisdom, in in language, not in wisdom, a delight in language that was just, you know, pouring out of me and that was connected to my reading life and. I've always felt like my writing is subordinate to my reading life. Like it's the thing that helps me to understand what I love the most, which is to 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 be a reader of poetry, you know, and a reader of stories, and a re you know, like to have this, you know, to have this full life that is, you know, in dialogue with my ordinary life as a man and a father and a teacher and every, you know all the ordinary stuff I do, but then you have this life of, of texts and, and this life of, you know, th these, these consciousnesses that you encounter on the page that are just so enriching and, <laughs> and so wonderful, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. The, the greatest thing in life, you know? Do you, I think maybe this is a, you, you already answered the question with that, but do you, uh, you know, since you write so much uh, to your, your two children, do you hope that they become poets too? Is, is that something or is that the struggle of it something that you, I would, you know, I would seeing, love it. Yeah. I would, <laughs> I would love it if they did. I, my wife, my wife doesn't write poetry, but she loves poetry. That's one of the ways we fell in love was talking about poetry. Um, and my daughter, she's five. And she's been to a lot of poetry readings already because my wife and I run a reading series and, you know, we have, we, we go to poetry readings when we can in the area. So she's been to these poetry readings and she will stand up and, um, you know, in our living room and she'll say, I'm going to read a poem. And then she goes and she has a piece of paper that she's crayoned some things on. And then she just recites a extemporaneous poem, like, it might be like something about her brother, like babies have 10 brains or something like that. You know, she'll just come up with, something, you know, and it's just, a, you know, so if they did write poetry, I would love it. You know, if if they were enriched by um, poems in the same way that I am, I'd love it. But if they hated it, I'd, I'd be un understand it completely, too. You know, like if they don't have to love it, especially if they have a father that loves it so much and, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> They're getting dragged, you know, once they get older, if they're getting dragged to poetry stuff. But my my daughter also will, you know, I I have a lot of pen pals who are poets, so she'll also like write cards to them, like do little drawings in in the letters I write and things like that. So mm -hmm. she's our correspondence with Bill Hayen and <laughs> H.L. Hicks. And <laughs> one thing I recommend, so, actually, and this is for all poets out there too who are parents. Um, you know, I had my daughter do, uh, since you run a reading series, I had my daughter uh, right around five or four even. Um, she was the first open mic reader every week at our reading series for Rabbit. Oh, and, you know, it got her, it gave her this like total lack of fear of public speaking for one thing. Like she goes up on stage, you know, in theater or whatever, and she just is like belting stuff out because she's been reading her own poems since she was like four. But then also it's great too. It's a little, a little subtle thing. To, it keeps people sort of, filtering what they're going to read at the open mic too because like oh there's a little kid here so i'm not going to read this uh, oh heinous God. thing and i think that the quality of the open <laughs> mic became a little better too thanks to her presence so a little suggestion there but uh but that's a lot of fun and she ends up uh, she's a songwriter now at 13 so we'll see uh we'll see what becomes of what but um a lot of uh, a lot of both going on there um well, let's hear another another section uh from the book I think we probably have time for like two. So this will be like the second to last. I don't think we'll get to all of them that you listed. Okay. I'll read the very, I'll, ve I'll read the very last section of the book and then I'll, 
And then I'll read the la- uh, uh, another Bill Hayen poem to okay. end, if that's yeah. right. Yeah, that sounds great. Mm-hmm. All right, so this is um, this poem. It, this this section, Envoy, a Traveler's Prayer. It was written to my friend Fazil Moyudin, who's a great poet. He's the guy that wrote the po- the line "Talk to Other the Ghosts" that I mentioned in the other section. He's got a poem called "Allah Castles," which he wrote about his son, who whenever he sees a um, he sees a church, or a synagogue, or a mosque. Um, he calls it an Allah castle. So that that that's <laughs> anyway. Uh, and f- f- anybody listening, Fazil Moyodin, the displaced children of displaced children, is his book length. Yes, has a chat book called The Riddle Longing, and he's got another chat book coming out this year, but I don't know um, where or when. But he's a wonderful poet. Um, all right. Anyway, a traveler's prayer. In a poem, a son moves into his father and turns him into a new country with a reconceived heartland. There is no talk of birth rate, no debate about child care and immigration. Borders in a poem are porous, and sons and fathers and wives and daughters migrate like swifts, and butterflies are like bees pollinating a prairie. They pattern their flights on earth and wind and water and dark from the most distant starlight born two galaxies away. My friend Fazil writes his son inside a house, a castle, the world, another poem exhaled from Allah's right lung. Meanwhile, my unborn son floats in amniotic fluid, a cosmonaut ascending the sable warmth of the womb. My own father has been dead, sparrowing in his grave now for years. I can feel myself moving in him even as I can feel my son kicking in my wife's belly at night. These motions don't dissipate with death and its ripe fictions. A baby's DNA stays in its mother forever, my wife tells me. I think of those helixes inscribing their ardent calligraphies in elegant, unruly ink on my wife's hemoglobin as we raise our two children. Just so we poets remain in our lines, our atoms etched in each enjambment, riding the rhythms that unwind there, rewriting each beat as it orbits away from the hand that wrote it from the open throat about to burst into song. Oh, poets, sons, daughters, we are truly holy when it is difficult for us to tell among the many places we have lived precisely where it was we felt most at home. This is the knowledge God gives. Family is rootless prayer. Those helixes inscribing their ardent calligraphies in elegant, unruly ink. Poetry is rootless prayer. And that is uh, the closing poem um, from the long book of poems, uh, Mid Whistle by Dante Di Stefano. Um, and thanks for that. It's a beautiful collection. Like I said, there's so many layers to it um, as far as, as what's going on. I mean, there's really, there's the, the, you know, the direct address to both, you know, uplifting William Hayen, the, the talking directly to your son, and then talking about poetry itself, too. And all three of those things are really woven together beautifully. So I hope everybody does check out uh, more of that book. There, if anybody has any questions for Dante, we got some time left. Um, leave them in the chat when it was either on Facebook or YouTube, and I'll pass any along. But there's two things I wanted to talk about still, too, Dante. You, one of the things um, is uh, SUNY Binghamton. It's such a great school. We talked about this when Abby E. Murray was here not too long ago. We had Maria Gillen on, um, but you got your PhD in creative writing, I believe it was, from uh, Binghamton or is it English literature? But either way, you're engrossed in that uh, Binghamton sort of aesthetic and, and community and, and the way it's taught, which is beautiful. There's two programs I always tell for the last you know 15 years. I've always It's just apparent in submissions to rattle that people who have been to either SUNY Binghamton or um, Pacifica University are the two, you know, they're the best, like, real, like, like sharing actual stories and communicating, you know, poets around. And what do you think it is about that program that's so special? And what was your time like there? Well, I, I'm lucky that I was born in Binghamton because <laughs> I never wanted to leave here. So luckily there was a university here that was, you know, really wonderful. You know, it's 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 a program that started under the you know the uh, the hand of John Gardner, the novelist, and you know 
he was such a literary superstar in the 70s and 80s. And then when I first got there in the 90s in my undergraduate, there was Ruth Stone and Milton Kessler. Again, I don't know how many people read Milton Kessler anymore, but he is a great, tremendous poet. And those were two of the poets that I saw reading at that time when I was really young. And, you know, you've got Milton Kessler, this kind of got the stentorian voice and, uh, you know, it's amazing kind of poet. Um, you know, he's one of his books has an introduction from Elizabeth Bishop. You know, like he was he was a, he was a, you know, a mover and a shaker in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then Ruth Stone, who, you know, is this little old lady, but she writes these, you know, just poems that you can't believe. Um, and they lived in the town and they, you know, they were recognizable figures. I never had them as teachers, but I saw them read. And um, Liz Rosenberg, who's a great poet, was one of the first people that recognized, you know, that that encouraged me. And, you know, she, she was she was just she just incredible. And then Maria, who, you know she treats every student like they're her baby, but she's also incredibly accomplished and she's such a serious poet and she's so smart and she's so empathetic and all she wants to do is help people. Um, so you have great teachers, Joe Weil, who I know you've published him in Rattle. He's a guy that, you know, doesn't even have a college degree and he's a full professor there. Um, <laughs> And he, you know, he was a he was a factory worker, and he wrote poetry. And he and he's written. He's another one. If you don't know Joe Wiles' poetry, you know it's some of the most wonderful poetry that's being written. And then when you know the students there, just great. When I was an undergraduate, I was in a class with Leah Umansky, who's gone on to do really great things. She's well known in New York. She's published in the New York Times, and you know she has a book coming out called Of Tyrant that's going to be amazing. She was one of my in one of my first workshops. Um, Christian Terezi, who has a book coming out from uh, Red Hen Press this year, um, what monsters they make of us. Um, in my cohort, when I was a PhD student, I had Abby Murray, <laughs> Tara Betts, who's a great Chicago poet, and um, Nicole Santalucia, who's just an incredible, incredible um, poet. Her, her uh, most recent book is called The Book of Dirt. So just like great people, great poets. It's the birthplace of Rod Serling, so it's a strange, oh, it does have that Twilight Zone vibe to it. And, you know, it's just, it's an interesting town, birthplace of IBM. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a line in a Joe Wilde, I'm sorry, I'm, I hope I'm not just going on too long. But there's a line in one of Joe Wilde's poems where he says, um, where nobody writes the air is strangely charged in metaphor, with metaphor. And Binghamton feels like one of the places where, although people are writing, it doesn't feel like a college town. Um, just feels like, well, to me, it just feels like home, you know. But mm -hmm. um, so it's just an amazing. Tina Chang is there now. I don't really know what's going on with that program now, but it'll it'll keep going and it'll keep producing great poets. And I highly recommend anyone who's looking for, you know, to go to school for poetry, which you don't need to do, but you know, it can be good, nice. It's a great place. Yeah, yeah. Joe Weil is, uh, you know, always been one of my favorite poets. And if he's watching, send me some more poems, Joe, because it's been <laughs> been a long time. But but that morning at Elizabeth Arch, what we published uh, years ago, is just one of my favorite poems we've ever we've ever published. So, uh, yeah, he's great. And just so many great poets come out of there. Maybe it is something in the air. Maybe he's right about that. <laughs> or just I don't know. I mean, I I always thought it was Maria, but it does go back farther than Maria too. Of great, just a great history. Yeah. There. Well, Maria. I mean, Mar Maria. You know, she she has definitely put her stamp on it. And mm -hmm. I, mean, I can't say enough about Maria. When I go and read in Patterson and see what she's done at that Patterson Poetry Center, I mean, it's just, she's she's helped so many people. And her workshop is just incredible. That I mean, when at one point I was going to her workshop, there would be like 40 to 50 people in it. There'd be people crying. There'd be, it was like going to a therapy session, a, a church, uh, you know, a serious poetry work. It was like all of these things at once. It, it's just like an experience that only Maria could foster, you know, yeah. just because she's dynamo and such an amazing person. Yeah. Well, if anybody, you know, I recommend going back to that episode with Maria Mazziotti Gillen. I, I can't remember what number it was off the top of my head, but maybe it was, it was a summer. It was either a year ago or two years ago. So either. Around, That's my like, favorite like, episode, Tim. Because is it? 
That's my favorite episode, not only because of Maria. It would be anyway because of Maria, but because of your sweatpants story. It's, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's worth funny. it for the sweatpants story. <laughs> yeah, well, go back. I won't I won't elaborate on that. But uh, but yeah, so uh, check out the sweatpants story back in uh, that episode with Maria Gillen. Of course, you can go to rattle.com slash rattlecast and just scroll down until you see it. And it'll be, either be around like 150 or 100. Uh, I can't remember if it was a year or two ago. I remember it was like in the, in a summer. But anyway, um, the other thing I wanted to ask uh, was about being a teacher because you've been a, a teacher, a high school teacher for at least 17 years. I don't know if that bio was up to date at the time, but, but maybe 18 at this point. But um, uh, kids must be so lucky to have you with your love of poetry as a teacher. You know, I mean, I, I never had a, a teacher who had such passion for poetry that you clearly do. And you must introduce them to um uh you know so many poets um so what who do you think is like the best gateway poet sort of for kids right now like how do you get them excited about poetry in 2023 is that something you've been able to do or you know and and how what do you do to get them into poetry nowadays well i just share poetry that i love with them you know and i also encourage them in their interest it, you know, they have started sharing like TikTok poems with me and before that Instagram poems and, uh, you know, and a lot of them like like Rupi Carr and stuff like that, whatever they like, you know, uh, I say, great, that's, you know, um, keep reading. And, uh, you know, the, somebody brought me a book of Lana Del Rey's poetry, which just got published. It was really interesting. You know, so these kids, they show me things that like I wouldn't have read Rupi Carr otherwise but I think it's interesting. It's interesting to see always, I don't really care as a teacher or even as a person that loves poetry, whether a poem is good or bad, you know, like mm -hmm. I, could, I care how it's making meaning. And I'm also interested kind of um, laterally in, in, in why s somebody loves something, you know, like, so, uh, so I just encourage, and, and I try to let them see that poetry is not monolithic, that there's all types of poems and all types of poets and that they can, they can enter into this conversation and write to these poets. And, you know, those are the things that I try to do. Um, and also just reading poems that I love and talking about them. I mean, what can be better than that for me? <laughs> but, yeah. and also I, I also always have it in my mind that just because I like something, <laughs> yeah. I mean, any of these kids can like, and, and they don't have to like it, but I think my enthusiasm helps. And I think meeting them where they are helps. And I think that there are kids, like if there's one kid a year that, you know, I interest in, in, in poems, if there's one kid in a decade that I interest and in, like reads poems for the rest of their life, then I feel like I've done my job, you know, in addition to the other things you have to do as a teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So much to do as a teacher that um, it's, I mean, I feel very lucky to be a teacher because it's allowed me to have a nice home and a nice family. And it's also kept me, you know, grounded. And, you know, you could do anything in the poetry world that you think is great, you know, get an award or have a book published. But then you go into school on Monday and you're with 120 kids in your classes that they don't care. They don't know about any of this stuff and they don't care about it. <laughs> they care about themselves and all their problems. And, you know, it just helps to recalibrate your view of the world. And, you know, like and I hope sometime some of my students, I mean, I, I don't hide the fact that I write poetry, but I don't like put it in their face either. You know, <laughs> so, you know. I hope some of them read my poems and find something in them. Cause I do write about school too, as you know, sometimes, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. and I write in school. So all of that affects who I am as yeah, a person. That's a, that's a great point too, about the humbling, you know, it is, it's really interesting to anytime you take poetry, anytime there's like a poetry drama, you know, I go tell somebody about it. Who's not a poet. And I realize how silly it is no. yeah <laughs> so a similar kind of thing but um but we have a, let's take one question from the audience and uh mark grinier um said wonderful assonance in these poems he noticed um is that something that you work on specifically or and can you talk a little about how to you know cultivate your ears they're more to just you know having that kind of music in the poetry than reading a lot 
Yeah, I think, well, yeah, it is, it is reading a lot, but it's also reading aloud a lot, you know, mm -hmm. it's also memorizing. It's also reflecting on the musicality of the piece of writing that you are seeing on the page, you know, and thinking and just going through your day and thinking about like how people talk in the poetry of everyday speech, you know, and, and thinking, listening, just listening, just paying attention, you know, just, just getting outside of yourself and turning yourself outward and, and, uh, you know, being a receptacle for the music that is all around you. Um, but then also channeling that kind of music into a subject matter that is like necessary, that matters to you, that might matter to somebody else. Um, and I think I read a lot of, like my favorite poet is Gerard Manley Hopkins. So, um, you know, he, there's nobody more musical than him, um, like over the top musical. But then I like somebody like Marie Howe, who's just like really austere and, you know, in some way, in on the level of lame language, simple in a, it, this, but deceptively complex as well. So, like, I think just reading a lot of different types of poems too mm -hmm. helps. Like, getting outside of your aesthetic comfort zone and thinking about, like, you know, I'm going to read a poem. I'm going to read The Skaters by John Ashbery, and then I'm going to read uh, a, a haiku by Basho, and then I'm going to read, uh, you know, uh, Divya Victor's Kith, and then I'm going to read, uh, you know, like uh the the red wheelbarrow and you know like i'm gonna have all these different competing musics and lucille clifton and you know like like just i don't know just i don't think that really answers <laughs> that question but i do like assonance and i like like all of the all of the um all of the echoes all the all the musical um you know uh kind of kin to rhyme you know like if you're writing at something that's that doesn't employ end rhyme, then that's, I mean, you, and you want it to be lyr lyrically musical, then you have to employ, but you're not thinking about it either. You know, like you're just doing it, you're just writing. And, and part of that is the, all the poetry you've read and all the poetry you've written, you know, like, I just like, you know, like guys, like musicians, like Sonny Rollins, who would just go on the bridge and play the saxophone off the Williamsburg bridge. And like, nobody's listening to it. Like that's a famous, you know, that famous story or like Charlie Parker going into a field and playing his saxophone to the cows, you know, like <laughs> way as a person who writes poetry, you're just always woodshedding, you know, you're always just riffing and riffing and riffing. And, and maybe you get to some kind of facility with music through that riffing. And maybe somebody hears it, like the person that asked that question, or, you know, maybe they don't, but yeah, it's just about inhabiting the music that, is all around you and that, you know, that you kind of mold into the dwelling place of a poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really well said. And uh, too, I, you know, takes it back to Maria Gillen talking about that, about, about how the, the way in is, is by reading and reading aloud um, into a voice. Uh, we're going to close out with uh, another William Hayen poem, um, Holocaust class. Do you want to, is there anything you want to say about why you wanted to share this poem in particular uh, from William? Well, I, I mean, it's a poem that takes place in a high school mm -hmm. classroom. And um, it is in the book Generations, which also has my um, one of my collections in it as well. But it's a, I, I just love this poem, and I thought it would be a great way to end a reading or a conversation because of how it ends. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just a lot of, you know, he's somebody who spent his life, he was born in 1940, his parents are both German immigrants. You know, he lives, he's, he's a kid during World War II. Then he gets a Fulbright scholarship or Fulbright and he goes to Germany in the 60s. So he's seeing like the aftermath of, you know, the Shoah. And it's something that this is a poem that embodies a lot of the um, thematic concerns of his entire body of work. But then also it's, you know, it involve it, it also embodies his kind of um, style, his late style, his technical ability. And I just think it's a great poem that I love more. That's, so you say all these things, but that's really what it, I just love. It, so. Yeah, um, that's great. Well, let's hear it. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Holocaust class. 
So I was talking and reading to a couple of combined high school classes. I'd gone on for a while about how we couldn't, could we, show poet Alden's affirmative flame, not after the Shoah, where in dreams of mine the perpetrators gaslight itself, actually gas the light in the chamber of human history. Imagine it, the empty chamber slowly filling with light, then a porthole slammed shut, and then gas pouring into the chamber, the primal meaning, the sheer horror of gassing light. So I'd gone on for a while in this vein when a student raised her hand and asked whether maybe we could all receive some kind of vision. Could we just begin again, begin from the beginning, let there be light again, begin with hope, despite everything? Why couldn't we just start all over again? Maybe grace might be possible. And didn't I agree? But I didn't know, given human nature and original sin and the biblical mystery of iniquity, whether I could agree. But then profound silence occurred in that classroom and a fluorescent light buzzed and flickered and my brain buzzed and flickered and I heard myself saying, let's begin. Yeah, that is a great ending and, and I agree. Great way to close out an, an episode or a reading. Uh, Dante Di Stefano, thanks so much for being a guest. It's great to get to know you after all these years. Um, you know, I feel like I do and, and now I actually get to say that I do. So thanks for, for being a guest and joining us. Thank you so much, Tim, for everything. Yeah, definitely my pleasure. Take care. That was Dante Di Stefano uh, with his newest book, Mid Whistle, which of course you can find from University of Wisconsin Press, and that's uwpress.wisc, W I C or W I S C dot E D U. Um, so find that book, Mid Whistle. Now we're going to take a quick break and go to our open lines. And as we've talked about, we're switching up the open lines a little bit in the way that we do it in that if you submit a prompt poem, you can submit it to um, rattle.com uh, slash submittable. Um, you can submit through submittable to become the prompt poem of the month next month. So we're going to take all the prompt poems that are submitted. Um, and then Katie Dozier, our uh, series editor, is going to be selecting one uh, as the prompt poem of the month, which we'll publish in September, in addition to any we want to share here, which is wonderful too. And this is really a way in which we will be um, just opening up the, the prompt poems and, and the, the impetus and encouragement to write a poem every week to the people who can't make it live. Because a lot of people listen to it. So the majority of listeners by far, you know, by a factor of like 10 or 20 or more, actually a lot more, listen uh, after the fact in their cars and as iPad, or iPods and all that. iPods? Do they even make iPods anymore? That dated me there. Um, podcasts, <laughs> like iTunes. Um, anyway, they listen to it uh, after the fact and don't join the open lines and so aren't encouraged to write a poem every week. And what we want to do at Rattle is promote the practice of poetry. So uh, having prompt poems is a way to do that. And so everybody can is encouraged to submit for the prompt poem of the week, which we'll publish it on Rattle.com, just like we do the Ekphrastic Challenge, etc. cetera. Um, this month of August, all four of the prompts will be coming up. Um, uh, we'll pick one and we'll publish that mid-September. So that's what we're looking forward to. But in the meantime, you can either, if you haven't submitted your poem yet, you can still email it to open mic. That's open M I C at rattle.com or submit it to, uh, through submittable through the prompt poems category. Either way I can show it on screen, but make sure you send it to me somehow so I can show it and share it that way. Um, and then join us on the zoom and I'm going to, um, put the link in the chat windows on Facebook and YouTube right now. So pop over to the Zoom and you can share poems, I should say, as well. They don't have to be prompt poems. They can be poems about current events. They can say po they can be uh, poems you published recently or you wrote recently or anything you want to share. It's open lines, uh, but send us some poems and, uh, and uh, join us on the Zoom. If you'd like to just read or sit back and listen, I should say, then uh, stay right where you are and keep watching on YouTube. You don't have to come over. Stay right where you are. But if you want to share, go over to the Zoom. And uh, I'll see you over there in just a minute.
we're back. Thanks for your patience. Now, um, let's see. The prompt for this week uh, was this right here. And uh, Katie Dozier is picking the prompts now, too, which is nice. It's something else I don't have to do. And uh, the prompt for this week was to write a poem in which something is cooked. So a pretty simple one to start out. Write a poem in which something is cooked. And uh, my poem is right here. I, we were on a road trip. We went to uh, you know, the San Diego Zoo and the safari with all the kids. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, but we drove back, or I drove back uh, today, uh, over three hours in the car. And then I got in just before the show. So I had to do something that worked in my head. And um, the, only, the, thing, the only kind of poem tree that is like serious for me that works I can just write in my head is, of course, haiku. And so I wrote a hyben, um, a little tiny hyben in my head and the drive. And this is grocery list hyben. Okay? And for those just listening, the, uh, the, things, the items on the list at first are, are crossed out. So it's kind of an actual grocery list. Look about it. This is grocery list hyben. Pork chops, butter, shallots, garlic, rosemary, apples, cauliflower, small kitchen, the slow dance of dinner. So that is my little grocery list hyben, um, something you can write in your head. Always fun. And uh, Katie can't be here today. She is uh, under the weather, unfortunately, but she sent her poem in. So we'll do Katie's poem as well. And this is Nana. And uh, here we go. Uh, Katie Dozier's poem, Nana. I remember the flurry of her hands as she told me not to stare at their spotted surface, the way her knuckles were knobs, calloused, through the years of pushing back against the thimbles. On the stove, apples ripe with cinnamon, peels strung out along the counter as though they were a scented ribbon. Not that weird package kind, she nodded at the stove. Her tea kettle voice, how it hung on the word weird, showing me anything like that must be feared, while the cleaver she cubed Granny Smith's with cut the sunlight. Meanwhile, the truth simmered with cloves, watched and waiting to reach a boil, She'd never let us take her picture. Instead of a flash, the crash of pots and pans into the sink. I soaked up her applesauce with a biscuit while she scrubbed. Bubbles floated up. I asked her to sit, but she said she couldn't risk it. So that was uh, Katie Dozier's poem, which uh, me and Katie are the two people who can't be prompt poem of the month, but so we can share them here anyway. And um, that was Nana by Katie Dozier. And now let's see uh, what everybody else has to share. And we'll go first to, let's go again, let's go to Nivedita first again, because uh, Nivedita has to run off to work and we don't want to miss her. Hey, Nivy, yeah, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you, how about you? I'm doing great, it's great to see you again. And so uh, what do you have that you'd like to share? Um. I have a sort of a prompt poem. Mm -hmm. It's about cooking, but weird sort of cooking. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that's great. Let me. Uh, when did you send it? Did you email it or did you submit it? Email. Okay. Let me pull this up then, if I can find it. Um, there we go. Um, and so, <laughs> not to fry your brain. A very important, uh, <laughs> a very important <laughs> lesson for us all. We don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to um, say about it before you read it? If it, all the title says how not to fry our brain, I think what most of us end up doing is getting our brains fried. So I think this sort of is a recipe for how we actually end up frying our brains while trying not to. Uh, yeah, that's great. Well, it's here. Go ahead whenever you're ready. How not to fry your brain. Ingredients. Brain, one number. Functional status. Ideas, as many as you can handle time, sufficient for rational thought, so probably one microsecond, rationality, one ounce, common sense, as much as you can get your hands on, as it's a rare commodity. Method, in a non-tempered vessel rests the star of the dish, a perfectly sourced specimen, pink and tender, ready to be worked on. Then the ideas are stirred in, drop I drop. Oh, wait, we need all of it, so just dump it all in. Then increase the heat and pile on the stress. This next step is optional. Add in some self doubt. Quickly stir for a nanosecond until the brain turns into a congealed mass. 
mess, no longer in the pink of health, but charred and grey, the brain sloshes around, floundering in a stew of its own making. I wonder why my respirant turned out fine. Oh, I forgot to add in the rationality and common sense. But those aren't important, are they? <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Very fun poem, as always. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nevi. Thank you, Tim. It was lovely being here. Yep. Have a lovely day. Yep, have a lovely day. It was a Nibby Thank McCarthic you. with uh, How Not to Fry Your Brain. Um, always fun. And uh, Nibby's got to go off to work, of course. Um, she is in India, so it's very early in the morning there. Um, next, let's go to Carla Schwartz over stateside. She's next in line. I am in the States. Hey, um, Carla. Yeah, how are you doing today? I'm okay. I'm okay. I had COVID a few weeks ago. It was not good. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. It just keeps going around and around yeah. and around like the... I don't know, sloshing of a fish tank or something. <laughs> Do not recommend it. No, I would not, yeah. Um, so I'm going to read this poem, uh, which is called uh, To Make a Pie. Mm -hmm. First, just imagine the blueberries. A thousand blue pearls that slide into your vessel as you play your fingers down the bush like harp strings. Oh, the slipping of berry to hand. Now imagine where those berries reside. On which island? Will you swim the miles there or kayak? And how the wind might thwart or aid your journey? Now step into your boat and go. I made that pie, that blueberry pie, with wind. The wind I fought to overcome, to reach the abandoned island with sweat that soaked my shirt that humid day, with joy of stepping off the boat submerged to my pants. The wind I fought to glean. I made that pie with the willpower not to eat all the berries before climbing back into the boat to return home. I made the crust, its cookie crumble self, with oil of coconut and egg and ground almonds. I baked the crust while I prepared the filling. How difficult can this pie be? Too few berries? Fill the rest of the crust with any fruit you can cull from your freezer. Peaches, rhubarb, add cinnamon, cornstarch, a drop or two of lemon for sour. Then bake and taste the wind, the fruits of your labor. Oh, that's great. Yeah, wonderful uh, extended metaphor, too, to make a pie. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, you too. Hope you feel better soon. Yeah, I am. Okay. I, I do totally feel better. Totally better already? Okay. Well, that's good <laughs> yeah, to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, great. Thanks so much, Carla. Yeah. Thank you. That's Carla Schwartz with uh, To Make a Pie. Um, yeah, excellent descriptions there, too. Okay, and next let's go uh, to Aud Audrey. Hello, everybody. Hey, Audrey. How are you doing today? Other than a bee bite. Oh, not a bee bite. Yeah, that's too oh. bad. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> you know, if it doesn't kill you, you have no right to complain. So, yeah, well, I had, a, you know, walking the dog last year. He stuck his nose right into this, like, you know, underground hive. And it was just, ugh, we, you know, so anyway, so he got a bunch and I got a bunch. I'm mm. glad that's not uh, happening again. <laughs> Hasn't happened. Yeah. Again. Sorry for your pain. Yeah, getting better. Okay, so here's a prompt poem. Okay. I'm looking for something new. Flipping pages of my new skinny taste cookbook. By dinner time, chicken legs with Dijon mustard, honey, balsamic vinegar, and maple syrup or slow cook to perfection. Ladle this redolent poultry and gravy concoction onto a mound of fluffy jasmine rice. 
And don't forget to inhale deeply before diving in. Chewed plastic remains. No meat, no bones or broth. Puppy approved. <laughs> oh, no. That's too bad. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Audrey. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful Hyben by Audrey Friedman. Um, another Hyben. We love Hybens around here, that's for sure. Uh huh. <laughs> we and that book was, I finished every page. I absolutely, highly recommend that guidebook. Yeah, I, we really, I, you know, I can't recommend the, the Hyben form enough. And that, that Hyben, a writer's guide, um, is just a great book by Roberta Beery and, and Lou Watts. Um, and, you know, it really is the form. It, it's so sort of easy to access a poem every mm -hmm. time I found, you know, because you start writing just like a, you know, diaristic type stuff. And then you're thinking sort of, no, you have an abstraction coming. I think it's just a great way to write poems. I think it works really well. And I think most people really don't understand the relationship of the haiku to the prose. Mm -hmm. And it really is so informative. And I think it would help any reader be a better reader as well as a better writer. Uh, yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, I highly recommend that book. And, and thanks for, uh, for preaching it, Audrey. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, take care, Audrey. Have a good night. You too. Yeah, Audrey Friedman once again with uh, I'm Looking for Something New, Hi, Ben. Let's go to a first-time caller. Make sure we get, and Gigi Capone is here. Hi. Hi, Gigi. How are you? And where are you calling from? I'm calling from um, Winnetka, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Ah, excellent. I apologize for my dog. He's snorting over here. Hopefully he's not too loud. No, it's not too bad at all. <laughs> he um, just started, of course, right when you called my name. Yeah. So I'm actually reading uh, my brother's poem, uh -huh. Ted Guevara. Ah, okay. So you not yeah. a first time caller because you. I think you oh, came and read a poem like two I, or three I'm years ago, too. I'm calling from I did. Uh, Winnetka, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the name of his poem is Engaged. Okay, let me pull it up. Here. Okay. Yeah, and well, you know, Ted always includes a photograph, which is always fun. So I'll show that oh, to everybody at home too. I haven't seen that. Yeah. <laughs> so his sister hasn't seen that yet. But here the photograph it is of a black and white photo of a hand sort of draped over an armrest in black and white. So uh, that's the uh -huh. photo, and here's the poem, which uh, uh, Ted's sister will be reading. Right, go ahead, we'll right. be ready. Okay. Engaged. Somewhere between Marion, Indiana and Chicago, there was a shimmering. I had kept the dial on low. Sizzling was never my soul out in the breeze. My old convertible on the flamed highway carried what was left of me. I was young, trying to reverse a drive that had to be taken. No other venue. On the receipt, it said, non-returnable if sized. Life warranties nothing. I was baked on the path. I had been a choice, but not a last ditch effort. If I were that, my days now would be cooler. She had been in bad vows. In that department, she was more experienced. Yet I was her bread so done that the air had risen from me. Her father wanted a stable life for her, not another bump and burst. I studied her hand while she slept. Shouldn't the excitement adorn a ring? What I had owned was radiated warmth. It came from her body. She was within touch then. I shouldn't have complained. What must come was still unmoving. Yet I ordered a token for myself for a chance to fill what I saw as empty. I could offer it days before she would go. I couldn't be her, I could be her father's relief, her stay put, her continued freedom. Yet in the shimmer, steam rose and dispersed into reality. The day she left, the ring I ordered remained snug unmoved from the box yeah very interesting poem by ted as always and great reading Gigi. it was so nice of you to call in and, and share it for him you're welcome yeah i hope you can do it again thanks thank you yeah and that was Gigi capone 
uh, reading Ted Bernal Guevara's poem, Engaged. So thanks for sharing that to both of you. Um, and now let's go, um, we'll go to Susan Talley next. Oh, let's see. Oh, her microphone, Susan Talley's microphone is not working, unfortunately. She's had a sign up for us, which is great. Thanks for letting me know that way, Susan. And we'll, may, I'll just read her poem. Since she is here, let me um, let me find if she sent it. Yeah, here's uh, it's her first Villanelle from Susan Talley. And I'll read it for her uh, right now. So, um, oops, here we go. Where is it? Screen view. There we go. Pigeons Roasted. Here. Okay. Pigeons Roasted. Spring is a restless soot and feather flight. Between tree and branch and window ledge, pigeons flicker in black and white. Caught in their fans, my poetry blighted. Fleeting time, their fuselage springs a restless, sooty, feathered flight. Part revenge or parody, their passage right. Imitations of clocks, flip-flops, even foliage. A pigeon flick in black and white. Annoying in the season of delight. In place of breath, in place of sigh. Shuffling cards as they fly. Spring is a restless, sooty flight. Pigeons flickering in black and white. Yeah, great, great poem there, Susan. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was Pigeon Roasted by Susan Talley. And, of course, I love a good uh, villanelle. So thanks so much for sharing that, Susan. I love the rhymes there, yeah, of course. Um, and let's go uh, next to – let's go to Sharon Ferrante, who hasn't been on in a while. Hey, Sharon. Hi, Mark. Yeah, great Hi. to see you. Yeah, I have not been on in a while. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm melting here in Florida. Okay. <laughs> I can. I hope you have better air conditioning than my lack of air conditioning down in Florida. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh no, I couldn't live without it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be hard. <laughs> so, so, I'm, on, I'm on my porch. I love to sit out here, but I didn't come out here until about seven o'clock tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I yeah. definitely, I definitely don't blame you. You know, because we have no humidity. You know, it's like. It, we're we're in the 90s, which is not even right. as bad as there maybe, but we have like you know no humidity, so it makes it a dry right. heat, as they say. <laughs> yes, I used to visit LA for years mm -hmm. with my girlfriend. Her dad lived there. Uh huh. But it it was hot, but it was not humid. No. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. sweat works. That's how, that's the best way to describe it. <laughs> but anyway, let's. But, uh, now, I I love this prompt, and um, the cooking, and I just. Uh, did some, I, I cooked up some haku and sanru, or your sanru, whatever they are. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I had some fun with it. Okay, well, let's hear. Okay, here we go. They don't, they're not linked or anything. I just put them on the page. Okay. In the kitchen, I don't know how to act. Meeting my flame. Hmm. Kissing you. Too much cilantro. In the guacamole. Bad habits smoking catfish. Waiting for biscuits to bake. Flaky friends. Dandelion. I add to the salad. A wish. Fondue dipping the moon lower. Oh, that's great. Uh, those were all wonderful. I especially love the cilantro and the guacamole. <laughs> that's a great one. Um, thank you. It was fun. Yeah, yes, well, definitely. I hope, uh, you know, with your love of shorter poems, I hope you're sending them to Frog Pond and, and Modern Haiku and, and all those. Uh, I, I, I'm going to have one coming out tomorrow in Scarlet Dragonfly. Oh, that's great. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, another to read it. In fact, it was an acrostic for... May, uh -huh. uh, for you, for Rattle, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I I have the places where I think I know I can fit in, mm -hmm. the Haku Corner, Japan Society Haku Corner, and the Scarlet Dragonfly and the Five Fleas at Chipotle. So yes, I'm I've sent it. I'm sending now. Well, yeah. that's good. It's great to hear because they're they're excellent. And you know, having seen all the, I, I've been reading a lot of of those journals that you know in the haiku community. I wish there was just more crossover between the sort of traditional poetry and haiku, and so it'd be great to to be pushing forward that way. <laughs> 
I just love, you know, I love those short things. Mm-hmm. I'm just going <laughs> to put it right <laughs> in like three lines and I'm done. Or yeah. one line. Yeah, me too. Well, definitely. Well, thanks, Sharon. A pleasure as always. No, oh, thank you. The interview was great too. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that was Sharon Fronte with a uh, a six a six pack of of haiku, including a two monoku. Um, okay, let's go next to uh, let's go to Dick Westheimer. Hey Tim. Hey Dick, how are you today? Yeah, good. I do like your white background now this this sort of lighter 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 room than you're in yeah i i like it too i you know when i made that uh, the old office i had when i i, I like the idea of sort of perpe- like a cave <laughs> yeah you know for working i kind of like it dark but i never i had no idea that i'd be doing a, a you know a podcast a live stream thing and there was just nothing you could do with all that darkness except sort of embrace the dark so it's nice to <laughs> it was nice to move out to a uh, to whiter spaces uh, a year ago. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. Um, well, I did do a prompt, uh-huh. but I, I've decided I'm going to read um, my. I did send it in to you, but I decided I'm going to read one of my poets' respond poems, "The Guzzle for an Empty Space." Okay. And it's primarily because I've not actually written a successful guzzle, guzzle and I'm just keep trying them out mm-hmm. and. I want to hear how this one sounds read into a space of poets who I like to read with. Yeah. Oh, well, this sounds good. Let's go ahead and give it a listen. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, uh, three notes real quick, uh, quickly. Um, one is the sort of prompt for it, besides being this uh, James Webb Space Telescope um, uh, image of the Ring Nebula and some of the poetic words in the article as I was listening, uh, one of your prior, prior guests, Deanna Riley, has a wonderful, wonderful weekly podcast um, called Poetry Hive, mm-hmm. um, or The Hive Poetry, and I recommend it to folks. And it was a discussion about Emily Dickinson and had this this um, uh, epigraph was in one of the poems that they read. It. Um, the second note is that the first line... Uh, is actually largely taken, just rearranged from the actual article. Mm-hmm. Um, I flip, I flip the lines around, but uh, and the third is there's a word in the pentultimate couplet called shiva, which is Jewish mourning period, is what that word means. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Okay. So it's um, uh, the epigraph is Emily Dickinson. Then space began to toll as all the heavens were a bell guzzle for an empty space. This is the fate that awaits the sun when it dies and leaves an empty space. A nebula will form and blast much of its material into space. Since my heart attack, we've slept separate most nights, you remaining in our old bed, me moving to a new space. Last night, My grandson chased fireflies in the woods while we stared through my telescope deep into space. Outside my office door, the toddler sobs to her mom about her brother who's taken a toy from her space. A star like the sun ends its life dressed in bracelets and rings like a bell and then its light ends moving out through space. Older now, Deb's in my body trying with more grace, though after coming me sleepless, I give her her space. This nova, like a plasma, electric and alive, is how I see myself after death, my memory bigger than all of space. Deb says when I die, she will not publish my poems, and after Shiva is done, she will leave this place. No one will figure this out for you, Dick, what remains and why you are here taking up space. Yeah, beautiful good guzzle, Dick. I think that worked really well as a guzzle. And I was wondering if that was yours. I remember reading that in the submissions. And uh, I was thinking, you know, you know, we'll publish your poems for you. <laughs> Don't worry. They will be, no, I'm sorry, say that again. We'll publish that again. your poems for you. There, you have many friends in the poetry world that will put your poems together. 
um, yeah. should anything happen, we'll definitely hunt him out and, and we'll do a good job <laughs> oh. of that for sure. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. And, and appreciated the interview and, and Dante's, um, Dante's work. And so glad there are high school teachers like him out there. I know yeah. a few. Really, I would have been blessed to have someone like that. I might have had, like, you know, a jump start <laughs> on the poetry yeah. thing. Well, I I have a, re a poetry community relationship with one, and I just love listen. You know, as a as a seventy year old student of his, I just love listening to him. Mm -hmm. You know, work out on poetry. So I to act with those seventeen year olds. I just love it. Yeah, well, oh, that's great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Dick. Excellent guzzle. And we should say it's a perfect segue to just to say that the. Uh, we have a guzzle issue coming up. I think the deadline is January uh, 15th. So, you know, work on your guzzles now, everybody, and get them in. I think it's going to be next summer's issue, if I remember right. I, don't know, I should look that up because last time I mentioned this, I couldn't remember if that was for sure the issue it was. I believe that's the case, though. But, yeah, thanks for, for doing it, Dick, and showing everybody how it's done. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care. As a Dick Westheimer with a guzzle for an empty space, uh, Karen Marker is next in line. Hey, Karen. Hello. Yeah, good to see you again. Um, good to see you. I'm, I haven't been on for a while. And um, the longer I wait, the more nervous I get. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. There's sort of a, you know, the, with repetition comes, you know, the, the nerves just quiet when you do it all the time because I, mean, yeah. I don't even feel it. I don't even, <laughs> as long as I have a, a shirt on, I'm happy. So there's, oh, there's that. Yeah. And following Dick's wonderful poem, this is so, and this is on the um, prompt, on the cooking prompt. Mm -hmm. And very different um, approach. <clears throat> okay, hang on one second. Let me uh, pull it up. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. So this is uh, Now My Liver Cooks, a very interesting title. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, Now My Liver Cooks. I don't remember anything else she cooked on the skillet. My mother said it would make me strong. All that iron couldn't be bad, especially when it's your period and you're losing blood. So I wouldn't get anemic. She fried it up with onions once a week. I grimaced, but made myself eat it. Never weak, never a good daughter. Can I blame my mother that I left home long ago? Despite the cramping, I gave up on her advice, stopped eating animals, and now my liver may be cooking itself. This organ, my awful, my offering, because all that's ever happened lives in my body. My liver is the seat of my life where the gods write their story. Should I blame Hestia who first presided over the frying pan, cooked up communal feasts of sacrificial meat? This goddess of hearth, did she watch holding the kettle, a branch on Santorini? where I breathed volcanic ash. My body hasn't forgotten. I was 22 that year in Greece. Or maybe, maybe another gang of gods were let loose. Oh, dear Zeus, it wasn't like I'd stolen fire. I wasn't meddling with forbidden knowledge that my liver should become like pate fedding an eagle. But already I had a curse called asthma. That day I gasped and trembled whatever it was that made it happen. When I went back to Athens, there'd be a shot of adrenaline with a dirty needle in a hospital with a striking staff. Chaos, confusion. It was too hard to get home. Everything lives in our body, swelling, jealousy, anger. I was a young woman in love with a country. From high up, they knew hepatitis had gotten into my blood, lurking there, hiding even when I ate clean, mostly good green Mediterranean food, never drank too much wine. The doctors said there was no cure. I knew there'd be some sacrifice. There's always something the gods are cooking. Yeah, really powerful poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Karen. That was a, a great ending, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, excellent. Thanks for sharing it. The Karen Marker with Now My Liver Cooks. Um, next, let's go to uh, Mike Bales. I found one of mine. 
one of my cooking poems today. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it'll be considered for a prompt poem thing. I just sent it to regular submittable, but put that I, I didn't see a category, but I put oh, yeah, that as a prompt uh, poem. If you go to uh, submittable slash rattle or uh, the other way around, either way it works, I think actually the, um, uh, there's a, it says Rattlecast Prompt Poems is the category, and that is the only way. So if you submit it to the general poems, it'll be considered a, you know for general poems, but for the prompt poems, it'll be considered there. And I should say, too, that anything submitted for the prompt poems category you know could, in, in theory, appear in Rattle, too. So it's all considered kind of for everything. But to get to the oh. prompt poems so we read them in time, you have or Sir Katie reads them in time actually. You have to uh, submit to that Rattlecast prompt poems category. So uh, that's a good good uh, point to bring up, Mike. And uh, make sure you I'll, go back and do that. I'll try that. Okay. Yeah. My next book went to the. Uh, I was going to the layout person. It's mostly poems, but a couple short stories and a hybrid poem at the end, which is kind of a strange piece. Oh, that's interesting. Um. Yeah, my poem, it's on submittable. It's Stir Fry. Uh huh. I feel like, like when I'm writing poems, I'm mixing things together, actually, or when I'm waking up in the morning. This Stir Fry. Okay. Frozen vegetables, mushroom pieces set aside. Early light shines through window as olive oil heats in a frying pan. I'm surrounded by morning stillness when a water drop sizzles. All is added to the frying pan and stirred. While sparrows fly past my window, a new creation is made to entice my day. Yeah, another great, another great ending to a poem. Uh, thanks for the stir fry by Mike Bales. Thanks, Mike, for sharing that. Okay, thanks. Yep, take care. Yeah, thanks. That was Mike Bales, stir fry. Uh, Laura Berg is next in line. Hello. Hello, Laura. How are you tonight? Um, just okay, this poem is called What We've Been Cooking Up. What We've Been Cooking Up. Okay, let me pull this one up. And that was... Um, a it's a prompt poem. Yeah, okay, great. Oops. Okay, tonight I am the emperor of pots and pans, wed to the sultan of dreams. We rule sweet red peppers and infinite permutations, jeté to the heavens to harvest spirits, then sauté back into the kitchen to season our goulash as one. So mighty are we, the spices tremble before us and crinkle their leaves. So benevolent are we that the trout fears not but leaps into the skillet. So in love are we. Such is our power. Oh, that's excellent, too. And I love the inversions there. The so benevolent are we, that, that little riff. That's great at the end. What we've been cooking up. Thanks for sharing that, Laura. Thank you. Yeah, Laura Berg with what we've been cooking up. Uh, next online is Joe Cottonwood. Okay. Hello, Joe. Good to see you again. Hi. Uh, I, I, I want to join Dick in... Uh, thanking dante i don't know whether dante's still listening but i'm sure he you. will he listens he told me he listens to pretty much every episode you know later though he's got to get up early for for school but yeah he'll be listening in a little bit <laughs> well i want to thank him for teaching high school english you're a hero and I uh, it is rough i you know i did i did poets in the schools you know for a while and it, it's not I, I just that seems like the hardest job really <laughs> and, and maybe, you know, difficult things are extra rewarding, but not enough, <laughs> not enough to make up for the, what you got to go through, at least in my experience. But um, yeah, for sure. But he talked about how he, if he could just turn on one student a year to poetry, he was doing a good job. And years ago, I was that student, not from him, but another teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it changed my life. So yeah, yeah, definitely. It is something that, that really it makes life, you know, so much more meaningful because we're making meaning and, and it, there's just so many benefits to being interested in poetry and exploring the world this way so it is it's just such an important thing to be doing and even if it's difficult to get through to kids these days uh it's definitely anybody who can get through it really changes their life forever so for sure i completely agree okay well I, it's a prompt poem uh for the cooking prompt uh -huh. called first fry bacon okay 
First, fry bacon. Not for breakfast, but for Ziploc bags to carry in your pocket, where even in plastic, they make you smell warm, crunchy, brown. Offer crumbled bits to every dog you meet. Make new friends. Greet the old. Then ruffle the ears. Squitchy scratch the neck. Maybe, if you get lucky, rub the wiggly belly. Oh, reader, yes, I offer you a crumble, too. No tricks, please, don't beg. Here, for nothing. I'm wagging my tail. You? Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to hear for nothing. First fry bacon. Uh, you know, Joe, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, excellent, excellent poem, as always. Uh, First fry bacon by uh, Joe Cottonwood. Uh, Mark Grinier is up next. We roll through the uh, open lines. Hi, Tim. How's it going? That's great. Yes. Good to see you again, Mark. That was an excellent interview with the Stefano. Yeah, it's really fun for me, to, you know, because I do. I see these people, uh, the poets, you know, behind the scenes in their poems for so long. And then to get to meet him is always a really fun experience. So it's cool to meet him, especially. Well, he's an interesting person. Okay, the, my poem is a prompt poem mm -hmm. uh, It's called No Matter Where You Go, There You Are. And supposedly that's a quote from Confucius, but I haven't had a chance to check and see yeah. if that's well, I like true. It either way, even if it's one of those false you ascribed, <laughs> I still like the quote. <laughs> okay. Lunch on the porch today, blue sky, the smell of T-bones on the barbecue, cobs of corn in foil with butter melting a little bit off the heat, barbecue beans, on the stove inside, beside succotash steamed into succulents. Colorful as summer days, family ways where brothers and sisters laugh and talk, completing their parents' trust that futures will come from love, like homemade bread kneaded and left to rise, kneaded again and left to swell into sweet-smelling loaves, baked until brown and crusty, soft in the center, Domesticity's delight in the uh, in an aroma of life well lived, a home being bo built from love and work, from tears and laughter, shared among those close to us who live with us and share with us the strength of an afternoon together here on the patio of life, enjoying another day. Ah, oh, that's great. Love the patio of life, too. And uh, you made me hungry <laughs> with that opening session in particular. Haven't had dinner yet, and uh, now I want it. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. Okay, thank you, bud. Yeah, that was Mark Grinier with uh, No Matter Where You Go, There You Are. I love that quote, too. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, next uh, we have Bishwajit Mishra. A few people left on the open lines. Hey, Bishwajit, how are you today? Are you there? There you are. Oh, I think your your mic is off or something. We're not hearing you, even though you're not muted. So, um, something came unplugged, maybe. We'll swing back around to you, Bishwajit, um, after we go to Julian Matthews. Hi. Hi, Julian. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, from poem called Leftovers, uh, just uh, two words in there that were uh, Tamil. Mm -hmm. So uh, one is manjal, which is turmeric, and the other is mean kalamba, which is fish curry. Ah, oh, okay. Leftovers. I know you prefer your fish curry a little aged. You relish the bits at the bottom of the pot soaked in spices, heated twice before, which you purposely saved enough of in the fridge just to get another stab at on the third day. It's as if all the aroma and goodness, all the care, sacrifice and sweat that your mother put into her curries, the decades bent over the stove, the years of making it over and over again until she knew instinctively how much tamarind juice and coconut milk, turmeric and fenugreek, coriander and cumin, salt and pepper to chuck in, yes, Chuck in, there was no tender, gentle sprinkling into the wok to make it work. We're all infused into the last dollop of what you call 
comfort food. You can even see her now, licking the salt off her manjil-stained palm, callous fingers waving spatula like a wand, the wrist action of a badminton player as you break bread, swiping the remaining curry off the insides and the bottom of the pot like a brass polisher buffing up a museum exhibit, the same pot you inherited and refused to get rid of despite its broken handle, misshapen base, signs of rust at its edges, because within the warm womb of this vessel, even three-day-old mean Columbo leftovers on salivating tongue still tastes of love. Yeah, another beautiful poem and beautiful reading too, Julian. Thanks for sharing that one, Leftovers. Thank you. Yeah, Julian Matthews, Leftovers. Uh, let's see if Bishwajit Mishra can get the uh, the mic going again. Hey, Bishwajit. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I that about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought I would do it without the AirPods, but <laughs> I think it might have been, I might have, you know, I should have changed the settings. Yeah. Well, it sounds good. So you're good now. <laughs> How are you doing it now? Always keep it up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. And how are you? I'm great. Yeah. It's a good, good night of poetry. Uh, uh, so beautiful. What beautiful do you have to poetry. share? Well, I have a prompt poem, mm -hmm. <laughs> a long one, two pages long. Anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so I'm ready to read now. Yeah, go ahead. I'll put it up. It's good and going. Go ahead. Uh, before I start, I, again, I have used some terms. If you don't mind, I mm -hmm. can uh, explain them first. Basically, the note section before I read the poem. Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay? It's really great. I love learning this kind of thing because I <laughs> there's a lot of stuff I don't know about the world. That's for sure. Dal, I think most of us know dal. What <laughs> dal is pretty common, but it's lentils of different kinds. It also could mean raw as well as cooked, like rice. I've used lowercase to denote raw dal, hmm. uncooked dal. Tuor is a kind of dal, it's Bajan peas. Mong is a yellow lentil, another kind. Haldi is turmeric, um, which is um, mostly ground form. In ground form, it's used in cooking. And hing, hing is asafoetida. Uh, and uh, I've used a term here, the part of process in cooking is chumka, in my language, Noria, or tadka in Hindi. Mm -hmm. And uh, Google tells me it's called tempering. Interesting, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and glossa, haiku, hive, and of course, different forms of poetry has got nothing to do with cooking. <laughs> but, uh, well, not, not completely dissimilar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Okay. So, it's called one of many ways dal can be cooked. Start with choice of the right candidate. I settle on tour. Next, rinsing. I don't know if there is a need for that. I always do that. But with moong, I sometimes throw them into the fray for a dry roast before the real cooking. The primaries are not the beginning. There is surely some stuff that must happen before. Place the pressure cooker and stop. Put in water. I'm not good with measuring. Just eyeball the cup and the dal. Dump the wet dal, the tomato too. My wife uses whole and copy. Throw in some haldi, salt, with hesitation, and put the lid on, and turn the heat on. They're out under pressure, trying to make sense of their past and future, both for the people, of course. My wife always gets mad as to why don't I test the salt to be sure, rather than worrying, simple. I'm probably a gambler rolling the dice, without closed eyes. Is that lack of confidence or pure adventure or belief in providential prudence? Like my voting, that is when I do. I have to keep an ear on the cooker. Steams keep, steam keeps building. I forgot to say, after the start, I roll the heat to low medium. Pressure keeps working, waiting in anticipation. I turn it off before the whistle. Throttle a sneeze, let it seethe, a long wait for the simmer, then dimmer, then cool down. That's not all, though. I take a look, stir, and the fun part is squishing the tomato with a ladle. The cool down after countdown, and then count. Uh, I yeah. bring a small... Oops, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. 
I bring a small pan, put some oil, just a bit. TVs are racing each other and giving out the test results. Just a bit of testing when the pot is still steaming. I throw in a pinch of five spices, a pinch of hang, diced onions, some ginger, that's my flourish, and ladle out some dal onto it. Results are out, but finals to be signed off. I dump the fried part to the cooker and stir to mix well, homogenizing the whole. After all, it's a melting pot. That's called a chunka or tadka. Sometimes I garnish with coriander, the final touch of the chef. Sometimes the courts would do that, as does a master chef at a show. They always keep you on tenter hooks, even if it's just a show. Why do I care? But it's the food and not just for the cook. I still cringe at testing. I'm worried about the salt. I may be a gambler, but to be honest, not so much detached to the results. But I can handle equally the modesty at the winning dice or the grace at the losing, uh, perhaps a little less equally. After all, it's all a leela, a game, and must be played as long as the last dollar and as vigorously as the last fire. Now, I really am going to test before my wife comes home. I am bipolarly practical, and it's just dull. Incomplete like the four-line epigraph in a glossa. That needs much more to come in to be able to call a meal. Exception is my wife who can just drink just it, like gobbling the haiku part of a hybrid. <laughs> I love that. I love that ending too, especially much better than the one that I thought for a second was the ending <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yeah, that is great. Uh, yeah, great thank metaphor you. there, uh, Bishwajit. I love that. Uh, thank you, Tim. Have yeah. a good night. Yeah, have a good night. Okay, bye yeah. for now. Uh, Bishop Shit Mishra with one of the many ways dal can be cooked. And I think the last but not least, we have uh, Lucy Chow. Hello, Tim. Hey, Lucy. Great to hear you. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Um, I'm, I'm going through an August that is very much... Um, a hectic month for poetry because I'm doing um, 30 poems for 30 days challenge for Tupelo Press. Oh, are you? To oh, do some right. fundraising yeah. for them. Oh, that's really and, cool. Yeah, so so we can find and, that, I, I assume, at TupeloPress.org or something like that? Yeah. Um, you can just Google Tupelo Press and go to their 30 per 30 challenge August. And you can um, see me among nine other poets up there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. TupeloPress.org is the website. Yeah, very cool. Well, looking forward to checking those out, Lucy. Congratulations on doing that. And I'm bringing um, Rotocast's um, prompt to one of my um, 30 poems. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving it a pretty sinister twist. <laughs> Um, because the, the prompt asks for a poem where something is cooked. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about um, this planet of ours that is going haywire in terms of climate. And I'm thinking about this uh, recent quote by um, the General Secretary of UN who says that we have ended the age of global warming and have entered the age of global boiling so i'm um, in this poem i write about we cooking our earth um i'll, I'll read the poem we, we yeah, pull yeah, it I'm also, go ahead we are no longer in the times of global warming but the times of global boiling broiling Braising, baking, roasting, grilling, stewing, steaming, barbecuing. The earth is a singed piece of meat. Those high boutique techniques of cooking, air frying our eucalyptus woods, evaporating our inland waters, lasering the skins of rainbow trout in simmering streams, 
somewhere on this earth in a high boutique restaurant, someone is boiling a lobster alive, while the ones about to pry it apart to gouge out the firm white meat scream so hard, sonic vibrations get the air boiling. Somewhere on this earth, calves, oxen, and cows are farting, ratcheting up the CO2 content in our 412.5 ppm atmosphere. Calves, oxen, and cows are eating mountain ranges of soy and corn raised from grounds raised of selvas that exhale either cooling cloudy whispers. Calves, oxen, and cows are being carnaged. Pink stained hands are breading veal and plunging it into boiling oil. Cheeseburgs are melting in the oven. The Antarctica is a molten slice of cheese. Describe this earth fate by Taramensi. Those high boutique techniques of cooking, crispening chalias and prickly pears, popcorning wheat seeds on their stalks, smelting will blubber in crucibles of living cetacean skins. Somewhere on this earth, girl scouts peel bras from pink sweating chests like sarin rop from moist and tender chicken breasts. Ice bags put on foreheads to heal heat strokes, wilt like ice cubes put in pots to make premium mutton soup, and a tourist plunges a thermometer into the sun-baked souffle of desert sand and reads 133 degrees Fahrenheit. Sunsets are greasy duck egg yolks. Some days we sit by the stove of the horizon, timing the heart boiling. Who's doing the cooking? We set the timer. But don't know when it will go off. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Lucy. A really vivid, um, you know, puts uh, global warming in some very vivid terms. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing that and, and making it real. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Yep, thank you. So, Lucy Chow with uh, We Are No Longer in the Times of Global Warming. Um, and that is going to wrap up the uh, open lines portion of the show. Thanks, everybody, for joining who could share poems. Um, and once again, let me say, anybody you know is welcome to share these prompt poems, especially. And then, if you'd like to go to, let me just show you where the um, where it actually is. So, if you go to rattle.com, um, you can go to here. Let me put the screen view up. If you go to rattle.com, you can. Oops, hang on. There we go. You can go to the content. Then you go over to the Rattlecast. And then Rattlecast, we have the link here. Submit your prompt poems here. And this is where to send prompt poems. Rattlecast prompt poems. If you go to the regular um, rattle.submittable.com page, you'll also see this Rattlecast prompt poems. But that's where to submit them. If you'd like them considered for the prompt poem of the month, the way to encourage everybody uh, to participate, even if you can't make the show live, which a lot of people can't. It's you know it's a certain time of day for some people, later at night for others. Sometimes it's the middle of the night if you're in Europe. Anybody is welcome to participate. We will pick at least one poem every week. I mean, every month, I should say and uh, publish that the next month from these prompt poems. Right now, last month's prompt is listed. As soon as I uh, end this broadcast, I will add uh, this week's prompt as well. So there'll be another prompt for August 7th or August 14th. Then we will uh, keep it going until we have four. Uh, the deadline for every month is going to be August 31st, just like the Ekphrastic Challenge. So it's kind of a, you know, a big deadline there, but that'll work out fine. And that is how to submit a prompt poem if you'd like to have your prompt poem uh, publishes the prompt poem of the month on rattle.com part of our regular email to everybody series and um, so that's going to wrap up the show for today let's go to the saiku and uh, the saiku is right here we pull up the uh, article that inspired it and the article was this from uh, uci news here we go uh, sweet smell of success Simple fragrance method produces major memory boost. And of course, um, you know, we have Prowse and Madelines or whatever. We have, you know, we all know that smelling something really triggers our memory. And um, these researchers took um, um, aromas and filtered them through memory care facilities at night. And um, with a control group and a, you know, and a test group and found that when they did that, 
um, for people while they were sleeping, um, there was a 226% increase in, in cognitive abilities um, during for the people who were going through uh, memory trouble. And so um, in, in cognitive capacity is how they compare it, um, you know, bring, being able to recall things and, and you know, passing those cognitive, cognitive tests. And so smell is really linked to sparking the brain. And they actually mentioned a thing that I did not know, which is that, um, let me see if I can find the quote here. Um, let's see. Yeah, at eight, by age 60, the olfactory sense and cognition starts to fall off of a cliff. Um, but it's not realistic to think people with cognitive impairment could open, sniff, and close um, 80 deodorant bottles daily, but that's what they recommend. So they did this uh, by filtering it through at night. But um, this is the thing that I didn't know. The olfactory sense has a special privilege of being directly connected to the brain's memory circuits, said Michael Yassa, professor, and James L. McGaw, chair of the Neurobiology and Learning of Learning and Memory. Um, and so all the other senses are eroded first through the thalamus. Everyone has experienced how powerful aromas are in evoking recollections, even from very long ago. However, unlike with vision changes that we treat with glasses and hearing aids for hearing impairment, there's been no intervention for the loss of smell. So a very interesting thing, but I had no idea that, um, that it goes directly to the memory circuits, uh, the sense of smell, unlike other senses. There's a very interesting uh, little, little tidbit there and great research, too, if it helps people um, you know, going through that phase of life. So the Saiku is the following. Forgetting until remembering that scent. Forgetting until remembering that scent. That is your Saiku for the week, and that is the show for the week. Now, next week's uh, prompt is going to be, you can maybe guess it, talking to Dante, but this is what Katie came up with. This is, write a poem in the form of a letter to a favorite poet that includes a suggestion for them. So it just do kind of um, what Dante Di Stefano did uh, with William Hayen, or Hayen, and um, write a poem in the form of a letter to a favorite poet that includes a suggestion. So we add the include a suggestion to them um, to make it a little more difficult, actually, and to make it so we don't just sort of have um, all a bunch of like praise poems. We want to actually open up sort of a kind of dialogue of communication. And so, so make it a letter with some real substance to it in the form of a poem. That is the prompt for this week and favorite poet as well. Um, uh, I do also do the poetry space with Katie on YouTube, or I mean on, on Twitter, and um, so go to uh, Katie underscore Dozier to find that. Uh, but that's a space where it's kind of a roundtable discussion every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And um, what we do is just talk about a topic. And this week's topic is your favorite poet um, or a favorite poet. So that's why we included this, too. So you can maybe uh, tie in both of those. Um, write a poem in the form of a letter to a favorite poet that includes a suggestion for them. That's your prompt for next week. And of course, like we were talking about, you can submit them to Rattlecast. Uh, prompt poems category on submittable if you'd like to have them considered for the prompt poem of the month and uh next week's guest in the rattlecast is going to be natalie padilla young um natalie was published way back in the speculative poetry issue of rattle issue number 38 and she has a new book out all of this was once underwater uh with beautiful artwork too um art by uh maximilian spiel and um so it's brilliant uh, artwork in that book and also great poems. And then we're going to be talking about that with Natalie Padilla Young, Rattlecast number 206, Monday, August 14th, at the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. I have to warn everybody um, that we have a power outage supposed to be restored um, at, 5, at 4 p.m. Pacific. And usually they're good about that. So hopefully <laughs> the power will be back on. If not, I'll like make a tweet. We might have to delay the broadcast, but I think we'll be on time. Because they are usually good. They're usually good at like overestimating how long these outages are going to take. They're doing uh, some line repairs and things in the neighborhood. Uh, but anyway, we will be here Monday night no matter what. Uh, Radicast number 206 with Natalie Padilla. So hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week in the meantime. And I will talk to you later. Good night.